Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think a lot of the talk so far has been sort of specifically to ECMO, but of course, short-term mechanical support is a whole range of things nowadays. So I'd like to talk today not just about ECMO, but a whole load of other bits and pieces. So I think there's a number of options we have nowadays for putting people on short-term mechanical support. We've got standard things we can use, like peripheral VA ECMO, which we'll talk about. There's also a number of novel devices coming through. There's the impeller, which can be used on the left and right side. And this is something that looks pretty much like a balloon pump that can give you a couple of litres of flow rather than the 0.5 to 1 litre you get with a balloon pump. And there's a percutaneous right ventricular support device or cannula called a Protec Duo, which you can actually place over a swan gans catheter that you can use for percutaneous right side of support. And then as well as central ECMO, we've got various short-term ventricular assist device opposite, uh, options available to us as well. So I do think it's worth remembering that it is only ever a bridge, and it's trying to work out what the bridge is to. Is it a bridge to candidacy? Is the patient too sick to really know what's going on? Are we going to try and recover the patient? Is it something for potentially for conventional surgery? Is it a patient who may do well with an LVAD? Or is this really someone who's going to end up needing a transplant? And I guess what we decide we need to do depends very much on where we're going with that patient. So I just want to talk on some peripheral support first. So this can be placed, so peripheral ECMO can be placed percutaneously, can be placed by a surgical cut down. Certainly our preference nowadays, if it's done percutaneously, is not to go for sort of a surgical blind stab. Uh, you know, that's okay, but if you have a patient heparinized for two weeks, every time you've punctured the femoral artery will be a different hematoma. So what certainly we do in our units is, is the ECMO team that do this will do a ultrasound guided single puncture approach. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, that, that really does help things. Um, we always use a distal perfusion cannula. Uh, sometimes in a very sick patient, it's impossible to get one in at the time. But I'd certainly counsel people who are going to do this sort of thing that if you're not going to do uh, that, then uh, you'll run into problems really quite, really quite quickly. Uh, ECMO is easy. It's fast. You can do it at the bedside. It supports the circulation and the respiratory system, but there is no direct unloading of the left ventricle. And this is the question <coughs> Professor Moon was asking Venkat earlier. And I think protecting the left ventricle and being aware that if your primary problem is a left ventricular problem, then actually supporting somebody with ECMO may not actually do the job for you at all. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, most of these patients have to do this in patients who are mobilized in bed. So this is, I guess, a pretty standard recipe for, for ECMO nowadays. We tend to use either an 18 French Optiflex or a 19 French Biomedicus cannula in association with an 8 French distal perfusion cannula. Um, we have, um, then we use either a 21 or 25 French multi-stage venous cannula. Uh, often we put in a, a balloon pump at the same time to uh, sort of initial LV offloading strategy. Um, and we have, I think like most ECMO centers now, we have a wet ECMO circuit primed, uh, and we have these strategically located around the hospital near the cath lab on the ITU in the theatre. Uh, and, uh, and this is the sort of setup you end up with it, and this is a, just a picture of, uh, of how, the, how things look afterwards. Uh, these, we, we've, we've fiddled around with lots of different ways of getting uh, distal perfusion, but now I think it, it, it's such a vitally important part, point of these cases. I think investing in some form of good distal perfusion cannula is, is really helpful. Our general experience has been with these sort of patients is if you have a significant complication in a patient on short-term mechanical support, that is normally it for that patient. These are, these are one-shot deal patients. And I'm not sure how well it comes out here. This is a patient who had uh, CPR onto ECMO and uh, the team struggled to get a dis distal perfusion cannula in later and you can see the difference in the, in the right leg after a distal perfusion cannula has then been placed. So there are specific problems with the left ventricle with ECMO. It does provide right ventricular support, but if the LV is very poor, if you just think about the physiology of the circuit, you know, ECMO will give that, the, the circulation a high afterload. You've still got residual pulmonary return to the left ventricle, and the LV is very poor. It just won't be able to eject that blood. That leads to LV distension, leads to pulmonary edema, ARDS, and ultimately LV stasis and thrombosis. So there's a number of solutions. A balloon pump is often enough just to give that little bit of kick to the ventricle to, uh, 
to, to reduce that flow. And of course, you can aim for a lower blood pressure. Inotropes can improve contractility and help some of these uh, poor ventricles just come overcome that. And then there's a whole variety of venting strategies. Um, we've taken to use an impeller, which is really nice, but in the NHS it's pretty pricey. It's a £9,000 piece of kit, but you can put them in percutaneously across the aortic valve, and that can give you, as I said, three to four litres of flow from the impeller. So we've used it quite nicely with ECMO impeller to then wean it off the ECMO, so you can, uh, you know, down sort of a litre, so you can see the right ventricles working well. And if you're getting three to four litres of flow with an impeller, you can then go and convert them to, uh, to something like a HeartMate 3 long term uh, ventricular assist device. Uh, you can do things as, as Venkat was mentioning earlier, you can just do a, a tiny little thoracostomy and just pop a, a you know, straightforward surgical vent into the left ventricle. You know, the textbooks talk about atrial septostomies, and we had one patient we talked to, our uh, Gooch cardiologist, about doing that, but that skill seems to be lost amongst cardiologists, so I'm not entirely sure how relevant that is. You can convert to some sort of short-term ventricular assist device, and I think some of these uh, percutaneous pulmonary artery vents, like the, things like the Protec Geo, work quite nicely for at least reducing pulmonary, pulmonary uh, return. So this is the Impeller 5. Um, so my cardiologist puts this in percutaneously. We can rewire it over a balloon pump site. You can flow it across the aortic valve like a tabby. And uh, so we can get about three or four litres of blood play with that. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on this, Owen. Oh, there's been a number of talks on this. And the, I think the bottom line is the outcome for ECMO depends on two things. It depends on how sick the patient is when you start. And it depends on how clean you can manage them. You know, no matter how well the patient ends up on ECMO, if you have complications, they tend to do badly. And, and as we've seen from both Mark and Venkat's slides, the, the rate of complications in all these, uh, in all these uh, patients are, are, are pretty difficult. And that sort of you know, 30 to 40% survival doesn't seem to be particularly uh, uh, uncommon. Uh, this is the other cannula I mentioned nowadays, which we've been using quite a lot in the last two years. So this is like the sort of the uh, Avalon or Paraglide uh, VV ECMO cannula. So this is a preformed uh, dual lumen cannula, which you can fluoro in. So what we tend to do is go to the cath lab, float a swan gans catheter, put a super stiff guide wire through the swan, take the swan out, and then rewire the super stiff guide wire with this. This has a proximal drainage port that sits in the right atrium. It has a distal perfusion uh, port that sits in the pulmonary artery. And we've placed this uh, percutaneously with a left-sided impeller to get total percutaneous uh, biventricular support then gone to operating theatre a couple of times now in patients who've had sort of multiple congenital procedures for a sort of alternative approach, say an LVAD through a left thoracotomy, then actually use this as our drainage cannula, uh, draining from both ports in the right side of the neck, and then done a left thoracotomy, put an LVAD in, and then come off with this then used as a, as a right-sided support device. So uh, central ECMOs, uh, some advantages, some disadvantages. I think you can get higher flow rates with central ECMO. I think uh, it's generally, uh, you know, into, into anti-grade flow into the arch vessels is probably preferable uh, rather than retrograde flow. And certainly, uh, you know, I think people, most people who are doing a sort of volume of retrograde uh, ECMO have had complications in older patients with peripheral vascular disease. And of course, it, I think if you are having uh, distal limb ischemic problems, it's, it's a nice bailout option for that. Uh, clearly, you often have to. Uh, open the chest in some way. I know Venkat is now doing sort of mini stenotomy and auxiliary approaches, but, it, but in general, it, it's a bigger operation to do, and it, it does mean if you're going back into further for stage procedures, uh, then that can, uh, that can be an issue. Obviously, then, the other thing we can use is short-term ventricular assist devices. I think Venkat and I both use the, the Patworth recipe that we were both, uh, you know, uh, trained well to do when we did our fellowships over there. I think the key thing for this is to cannulate the LV apex. It avoids, uh, it avoids stasis within the left ventricle. Uh, it avoids clot forming there. Um, and we would turn that to the aorta, and then, uh, and then we did with a, a second uh, right side assessment from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery. I think a lot of us now try and avoid bypass for doing this. Um, certainly when I came back from, uh, from Patworth, after Stephen Suey's tutelage, I was trying to do this off pump, and that, that works pretty well. I think sometimes your anaesthetist can be quite concerned if you do it off pump with very poor left ventricular function. Although uh, we were certainly doing it with NERS to make sure that when you were uh, when you were lifting up the heart, that you were still getting adequate cerebral oxygenation. But certainly from Chessington to Venkat to ISHLT the other year, 
I think like I've gone to doing what Venkat now does, which is going on to central ECMO first. So right atrium to ascending aorta, and then after you've got the patient nice and safe with that, then putting in your LV and your poor PA cannula. And I think it makes a massive patient difference, certainly in really sick patients avoiding cardiopulmonary bypass. And certainly our bleeding rates, if not for exploration, because I think we were both trained, these patients just can't bleed because if they do, they never stop. Uh, just our use of blood products has dropped dramatically since then. And this is what our central mag bivad card looks like, which is again probably pretty standard in all the centres. I think post op with a biventricular assist device, one of the key issues is to balance the ventricles and TOE. There's lots of uh, you know dogma about flows should be bigger on one side or the other. But I think certainly in the uh, you know in the early days of putting your implant in, you know PVR changes, SVR changes, and what you want is a nice balanced ventricle. We try and remove the oxygenator from that as soon as possible. I think if you do leave an oxygenator in, you know, they do have increasing hematological problems over, over the four coming days. And we try and actuate patients as soon as possible. We tend to start edge sitting our bivad patients at about a week, and we get them out of bed at two weeks and start walking around the ITU. But we, and then we try and avoid any further bridging or transplant operations though till they're off all their inotropic support. Um, I guess one thing to mention, just there are concerns sometimes if you're going from ECMO to, to a bivad setup. I think on full ECMO flow, you have very little pulmonary blood flow. This can often be exacerbated by poor left function. We often try and flow to swan gans catheter, so we try and make sure there's some pulmonary blood flow at that stage. We try and titrate inotropes to, to a nice PA trace, and we look at the end tidal CO2. But we are aware that even, even we've done that, we've made sure there is some blood flow through the lung when patients are on ECMO. If you then go to uh, you know, a biventricular uh, type setup, I think sometimes that sudden reperfusion of the lungs and sudden high blood flow of the lungs uh, may mean that you end up with an ARDS type, very white chest X-ray picture. So certainly if we go from ECMO uh, to a bivad, irrespective of how good the lungs would appear, we'd always do that with an ECMO circuit in for at least the first, first couple of days. Uh, post cardiostomy support, uh, you know, again, I think it's worth remembering that we've got all these different methods. It isn't just ECMO. We don't just have to have ECMO uh, on the shelf. Clearly, if you can't come off bypass and you've had some unexpected problem, then central ECMO, I think, is probably the most straightforward way of doing things, certainly in an older patient with peripheral vascular disease, uh, you know, who you're not planning on doing that. I think peripheral ECMO, if you, you know, for the right patients, can be very helpful and clearly allows you to decannulate patients without taking them back to theatre. But I think it's worth remembering there's a lot of novel uh, support devices out there that you can use to get just a bit more blood flow. But in general, these are bridge to recovery patients, and the results I think are always going to be poor. Um, I think it's always worth working out uh, in advance what you're going to do with these patients. And I think any patient who you generally think is going to have a very significant risk of uh, of needing mechanical support should have at least some form of transplantation workup before we do the procedure, so at least we know where where we're going with that patient. I guess just a couple of cases, if you don't mind, just to show ideas of bits and pieces of what we've done. So this is a 19-year-old student who presented with a three-day history of uh, nausea and vomiting. He then uh, he presented to our A&E with a pH of 7.1, base excess of minus 20, and lactate of 17. And she promptly arrested in the A&E. She had CPR onto ECMO. Um, LV looked quite distended, and uh, Sir Lynn, my cardiologist put a uh, impeller into her and that worked really nicely. She normalised the biochemistry well, RV function looked pretty good. Uh, we were able to wean her ECMO down to a couple of litres with a few litres of impeller support, but there was no further improvement in RV function and we uh, bridged her with a heart mate 3 and she was discharged home 17 days later. Um, we had this lady who was a 36 year old lady who's three months postpartum. She was referred for us from the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. We are about an hour's drive north. She had recurrent VT and CPR from Oxford to Birmingham. Uh, Mr. Santo, my registrar on the corner, put her on ECMO when she arrived into our ITU. Uh, she, uh, she did well following that. She normalised her biochemistry, but she had problematic pulmonary edema and really poor LV function. And we actually made a decision to convert her to a central bivad the following day. There were no complications following this. She was extubated 40 hours, hours later with her on the urgent transplant list. The problem was she was really highly sensitized. She had a number of really difficult pregnancies. Uh, and whilst we were waiting for some suitable offers, we actually got a regional improvement in her function. Uh, she was supported in her ITU for a number of months. 
uh, but she went home alive and well with normal pie and triple function after we implanted it. And this is a video of her walking around our intensive care unit uh, supported on her bike. <laughs> Um, and our third case, just to mention this in terms of different types of support, I guess, for, for our conventional surgery, this is a case I did this time last year, a 16-year-old male with long-standing diabetes who was presented to one of our local hospitals with a late presentation STEMI, he had a trauma rise of 6,000, very poor left ventricular function, severe mitral regurgitation, pulmonary edema, intubated, ventilated and supported the balloon pump in that hospital. He was deteriorating on anotropic support, but he was turned down for local hospital for coronary surgery and mitral valve surgery, and uh, he was discussed with us. We didn't think it was great for a transplant or even a VAD, but we thought we'd at least bring him over and see what we can do for him. He went uncomplicated surgery, a uh, couple of grafts and a mitral repair. And it's actually weaned from bypass quite, quite surprisingly well, actually, and uh, in the first 24 hours, uh, he looked pretty good, but I guess that was just the honeymoon, and then what we had over the next 24, 48 hours was VT storm, which the cardiologist tells me actually complicates up to 10% of patients who've had a, a big STEMI. Um, so what, what do we do at this stage? He wasn't a great really for peripheral ECMO. I didn't particularly want to go back in and put him on central ECMO. His old function was going to be very poor. He needs some sort of venting strategy. His tissue quality wasn't very good. Um, I was a bit worried about his VT storm. Was it ischemia driven? Had he not revast something? You know, were his grafts okay? So we took him to the cath lab. Uh, angiogram confirmed he had full revast with all his grafts patents and our uh, cardiologist rewired his balloon pump with an impeller. Uh, he supported with an impeller for, with uh, about three and a half litres of flow. We weaned all his inotropes off, his function gradually improved. The impeller was removed a week later, which is obviously off licence, but his discharge was about a month later. I saw him in clinic a couple of months ago and he's relatively stable with okay LV function. So a whole mixed bag of stuff.